Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think uh, a lot of the names that I'm seeing in my participants list are some people who were in last year's training. And um, welcome back. So what we're doing this year is assuming that most everybody had some basic food safety training, whether it's serve safe or were in the seminars last year. Um, I am going to do a very quick review of some basics and food safety um, and then jump into some new topics that we did not discuss in the past. And this is um, some of Needham's new health policies for food service establishments. So at any point, I can't see anybody um, or Ali, I can't see you. Um, so if somebody has a question, um, if you raise your hand, I can't see you. So maybe Ali, if you can be a moderator for me, that would be really great. Sure. So um, what I'm covering today, and I have a very short amount of time, so I'm hoping that I'm able to um, get through this in the hour that I have allotted. And another hint to Allie, I tend to talk more than uh, Tiffany, so if I start to run a little bit late, you can also give me a little nudge, <laughs> however you want to do that. Sure. Um, but just to review some of the basics, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, but it doesn't hurt to kind of go through a refresher. Things that I felt important to talk about in any food safety training, whether you are in training for the very first time or you've attended 10 courses is talking so, about really oh. what a foodborne illness is. I'm um, talking about those TCS foods um, as they changed in Massachusetts uh, recently, as recently as about four years ago, um, talking about risk factors for foodborne illness, uh, the importance of temperatures, proper thawing, cooling, um, date marking is a, a really important um, part of the new food code that we adopted a couple of years ago. So I will slow down and go into more detail there. Um, what I'm finding doing our inspections is this is the one um, issue that I could say pretty much 100% across the board, we are still working with people for compliance on this. Um, some basics on cleaning and sanitizing pest control. And then we'll jump into the Needham's food code enforcement, some of the new information that came out um, Ali, correct me if I'm um, wrong. Has this been approved as of October, the new food code enforcement documents that you sent me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Very good. So I'm going to jump in. Let me click on my next slide um, and talk about what a foodborne illness. Ultimately, the reason why we have these regulations, why we have the food code, um, the Massachusetts food code, why Needham has their own um, regulations as well is ultimately our big goal is to prevent a foodborne illness. A foodborne illness, sometimes people call it food poisoning, but it's basically a disease that is um, caused by eating food that has something harmful in it. And the usual culprits um, would be bacterium. And we've all heard of different types of bacteria that's associated with food. So we've heard of E. coli, which is often associated with undercooked hamburger, um, Salmonella, which is a pathogen associated with poultry. Um, viruses is another common pathogen. And what's interesting in the last um, probably 20 years, um, viruses used to be our biggest threat to food safety. And that's no longer the case. Now viruses represent about 70% of all our illnesses and outbreaks in this country. So this is a really important thing to keep in, track, keep in mind because viruses are really much more difficult to control than bacteria. And two viruses that you have probably heard about, um, one is hepatitis A. And prior to uh, COVID, that was probably the greatest threat that we had into our restaurants. And then COVID hit and then everybody forgot about all types of foodborne illness. Um, but hepatitis A is one of them. And another one that is very, very common, you may have heard of norovirus. Um, if you weren't familiar with the name, it is the initially the virus that was associated with all the cruise ships. But a lot of the changes to the food code that we adopted in 2018 um, are really to deal with and control norovirus because it really can be um, devastating and deadly to um, highly susceptible populations, which I'll be talking about. Um, parasites, not a huge risk, um, but parasites, most commonly we um, think of um, sushi that might have the worms um, in the raw fish, that if it's not cooked thoroughly or frozen properly, that that can create a hazard. And then toxins, um, people can ingest toxins from a variety of sources. Some um, foods naturally are toxic. So for example, there are certain mushrooms that are edible, not toxic. There are some that are not edible if they are inadvertently served um, in a restaurant, uh, toxin can make somebody very, very ill. Um, there are certain types of bacteria 
uh, that the bacteria in and of itself doesn't necessarily cause illness, but when this bacteria is in um, an environment like an anaerobic environment, um, the bacteria can produce a toxin and it's the toxin that make people sick. But really um, much of what we are trying to prevent is a foodborne illness by time temperature control, which helps with um, bacteria and good personal hygiene really helps control our viral foodborne illnesses. So looking at statistics, um, these statistics are relatively new. These came out about 10 years ago when I first started in the world of food safety way back in 1997. Um, every single year in this country, we had about 76 million people develop a foodborne illness every year. And the numbers of deaths were between five and 10,000 people. Those are huge, huge numbers. Um, in response to this, around 1999, the FDA um, really started encouraging states to um, update their regulations, include training food service managers so they became the food protection manager. They get the serve safe certificate. That number dropped dramatically from 76 million people to only 48 million people develop a foodborne illness. And I laugh at that because when I say we now only have 48 million people developing a foodborne illness, that is a huge number. But we still have um, about 3,000 people die every single year from a foodborne illness. And this is a shocking statistic. And eating food is something that we can't stop doing. We can cut out other risks in our lives, but we have to eat. And eating, if people are eating food that is not safe, not only do they get very, very ill, but we do have a lot of deaths um, every single year. Speaking of the deaths, um, an important thing to keep in mind is that usually when somebody dies from a foodborne illness, they are from what we call a highly susceptible population. Highly susceptible populations are those groups of people who are much more likely to develop a foodborne illness than the general population. And once they develop a foodborne illness, they're much more likely to suffer severe consequences. General rule of thumb, we're talking about children that are very young. And in the food code, it's pretty much defined as children, um, preschool aged children, so under the age of four. However, a caveat to that is for E. coli in serving hamburgers that are not fully cooked. Um, a highly susceptible child is anybody under the age of nine. And I can talk about that in a little bit when we talk about consumer advisories and serving children um, hamburgers that are not fully cooked. Um, the elderly would be another um, group of people that are considered highly susceptible. Their immune systems are not as strong as they used to be and would be much more likely to get sick. And if they get sick, to have severe complications, including death. Uh, pregnant women, uh, when a woman becomes pregnant, her immune system will weaken so that she doesn't reject the fetus. So with a weakened immune system, she is also more likely to develop a foodborne illness and have severe complications, including um, losing the baby. Baby can be born um, with lifelong complications if she becomes um, infected at the very tail end of the pregnancy. Early on in pregnancy, she could lose the baby to a miscarriage. And then we have an all-encompassing category, anybody who is immunocompromised. And basically what this is, is anybody who has a weak, weakened immune system for any reason. They could be on chemotherapy because they have cancer. Uh, they could be on steroid therapy. They could have had a bone marrow transplant. Uh, somebody maybe has AIDS or HIV. So all of these conditions uh, would make them much more susceptible to developing a foodborne illness. And one of the things that I talk about when we have some of our food safety classes is um, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I do this at my home so I can do this at the restaurant. And my point is you have to assume everybody coming into your establishment, whether you're a restaurant, you're a nursing home, you're a daycare, you're a hotel, you have to assume that some of your guests are going to fit into this category and you have to serve food safely, assuming that you have highly susceptible people working or um, consuming the food prepared there. So let's talk about some foods. Um, if you have been in the industry for more than five years, one of the um, common terminologies that we use for risky food items were potentially hazardous foods. When we adopted the new food code about four years ago, we now called these food items time temperature control for safety foods. The abbreviation is TCS foods. And I think of these TCS foods broken down into three different categories. So 
TCS foods, first of my categories is going to be my high protein animal-based foods. So any type of poultry, raw or cooked, any type of meat, raw or cooked, fish, shellfish, eggs, dairy. And these are foods that we all know automatically when we get these in our back receiving docks, when we get home from the grocery store with these food items, they have to be refrigerated immediately. All of these foods naturally contain bacteria on them. If they are left out um, at room temperature, the bacteria can grow to levels that cannot even be destroyed by normal cooking temperatures. So my high protein animal-based food items, these are foods that require time temperature control for safety. Another category, and this is one that is not as obvious for a lot of people, but the FDA calls these heat treated plant foods. And I just call this in plain, simple English, cooked fruits or vegetables. And it's cooked, heat treated, fruit or vegetables, plant foods, such as baked potatoes. It could be mashed potatoes. It could be French fries. It's cooked rice. It's blanched celery, um, boiled carrots. It could be uh, grilled eggplant. Um, any type of plant food, I eat a fruit or vegetable, that you heat treat in any way, it absolutely becomes a TCS food. So just like any of your high protein animal-based food items, these must be hot. And I'm gonna talk about specific temperatures or once they've been heat treated, they must be cooled and kept cold. Otherwise at room temperature, just like the other foods, the bacteria can and will grow. And then there are a handful of other TCS foods that we wouldn't naturally automatically think of as um, those food items that require time temperature control, but based on history and experience with these food items, we know that they have been implicated in numerous outbreaks. So they are included in those foods that have to be under time temperature control. So cut leafy grains, this would include um, any type of um, lettuce, it could be spinach, it could be cabbage that is um, packaged and prepared and ready to go. And I'm sure many of you listening in um, have been involved with recalls of romaine. It seems like we've had a lot of romaine recalls in the past, I don't know, 10 years. Raw sprouts would be another TCS food, and this could be alfalfa sprouts, bean sprouts, radish sprouts. An interesting thing with sprouts, they have been implicated in so many outbreaks over the past, I don't know how many years, 25, 30 years, that it is outright illegal to serve raw sprouts in a population that serves highly susceptible people. So if you are um, listening in from a nursing home or you are in a daycare or you are in a hospital or a burn unit, you cannot serve raw sprouts. Uh, cut tomatoes. Um, this was added on when we adopted the code in 2018. Um, cut tomatoes, slice, dice. If you take a knife to a tomato, it becomes a TCS food and it has to be under time temperature control. Uh, tofu, um, to me, that's kind of an obvious category. It's a substitute sometimes for some of our uh, meat items. And then garlic and oil mixtures. If any of you have gone through a class or you've gone through one of my classes, I, I talk about garlic and oil mixtures because this is um, kind of a scary food item. Garlic and oil mixtures that are not under time and temperature control are risky for the growth um, of bacteria, specifically a toxin, a bacteria that produces a toxin called botulism, if you've heard of this. It is um, probably one of the most deadly of all the foodborne illnesses. So our TCS foods, the foods that you need to be very, very conscious of um, being under time temperature control, just again, is going to be those high animal based uh, protein items, the heat treated plant foods. And then we have these kind of funky other food items in our category. So the next thing I, I want to talk about, um, we know what foods are risky. Um, the CDC and the FDA came up with some risk factors for developing a foodborne illness. And there's basically five big risk factors that I'm going to talk about that are associated with people developing a foodborne illness. And it could either be one or a combination of these risk factors. Um, and I will go through them individually. Um, but one of them is um, getting food from unsafe vendors. Um, one would be inadequate cooking. Another one would be inadequate hot or cold holding, contaminated equipment and poor personal hygiene. So I'm gonna go through these one by one. 
So major risk factor for somebody developing a foodborne illness is getting your food from an unsafe vendor. So this would be a vendor um, who is most likely not registered um, with the state or has a wholesale permit. Um, possibly they are not getting their food from safe sources. Um, in one of my classes, I talk about an outbreak of norovirus that occurred many, many years ago from a woman who was selling pies to the restaurant industry. And she was making the pies in her home. Long story short, the uh, countertop in which um, she used to roll the dough was the same countertop that she used to change diapers. And there was a little outbreak of norovirus. So that is clearly an example of an unsafe vendor. But um, somebody who wants to go foraging on their own for mushrooms, um, again, some mushrooms are edible, some of them are toxic. Uh, it's very difficult to distinguish between the two unless you have an expert um, who is able to identify the safe versus the unsafe mushrooms. Um, improper hot and cold holdings. So this is a huge one. Um, improper hot holding. Temperature danger zone changed about four years ago in Massachusetts. The temperature danger zone now recognized not only in Massachusetts, but most of the states across the country is 41 to 135. I always tell people to memorize those two numbers. Those are the most important numbers that you're going to know when you are working with food. All cold food must be held at 41 or colder. All hot food must be held at 135 or higher. And you'll notice, um, and I don't know if you can see me with my cursor pointing or not, but um, to the right here, I have a little um, uh, drawing of a thermometer here. And it shows in blue how the bacteria will grow. And this is what the temperature danger zone is between this 41 and 135 mark. So your goal with all of your TCS foods is to keep them outside of this range as much as possible because bacteria will grow. But you'll also notice something else in this slide. In red here, it says pathogens grow rapidly. And this is a temperature range between 70 and 120 degrees. Not only is this right in the middle of a temperature danger zone, but I call this an extreme danger zone. And to give you an idea, I'm gonna use my water bottle cap here to give you an idea. Um, let's. Let me back up. So food that is sitting in the extreme danger zone um, that's contaminated with bacteria and naturally has bacteria on it, that bacteria can double every 10 to 15 minutes. So during this extreme zone, so 70 to 125 degrees, let's assume that this is one bacterial cell. In 10 minutes, it's going to double to two, to four, to eight to 16 is going to grow exponentially to the point after a couple hours, this room would be completely covered, would be filled from floors, walls to ceiling with this one bacterial cell. So when I'm out doing inspections, um, I am concerned about temperatures, 42, 43, 45. It's much less risky than finding temperatures of hot food that have dropped down to like 100 or 110, 120. That is almost like storing your food in an incubator with an attempt to have bacteria growing. So know those temperatures, 41 to 135, that is your danger zone. Your goal is to keep your foods out of that temperature range. So another major risk factor, and I'm actually, if you're able to either chat it or unmute yourself and answer me here, uh, another major risk factor is inadequate cooking. So inadequate cooking, um, my favorite food items, I like hamburgers that are purple bloody rare. I love sushi. I love raw oysters. I love traditional Caesar salad dressing where they're mixing it on uh, the table side with the raw egg. These are incredibly risky food items to consume, particularly for your highly susceptible populations. But inadequate cooking. So I'm going to do a quick uh, review of some of my temperatures here if you wanted to take notes. Um, temperature for cooking poultry. Anybody have an answer? Nobody's going to chat. Feel free to me. put it in the chat if you want. <laughs> And if you do put it in chat and Ali, if you want to read it. So anybody. Um, 145. Cooking, up a little bit.
I will go ahead and answer for you. So cooking temperatures for poultry is 165 degrees. Um, cooking temperatures for any whole meat or whole fish. So talking something like um, steak or fish or pork, that would be 145. If we're grinding something, we're making meatloaf, um, hamburger, um, fish cakes, that ground product would be cooked to 155. However, ground turkey, ground chicken is always going to be 165 degrees. So I'm going to go in the reverse. So 165 degrees would be the highest of my cooking temperatures, which is going to be poultry. Um, it's going to be anything stuffed or any stuffing. 155 is going to be for our ground meats or ground fish, not turkey. That's a higher temperature. Um, and then 145 is going to be my whole meat, whole fish. Um, eggs actually have a couple of cooking temperatures, which I'm not going to go into now because we only have an hour for this class. But what um, I want to point out here is a hamburger. And I'm going to talk about this again um, with hamburger. I mentioned that I love my hamburger, purple, bloody rare, but this is a very risky item for my highly susceptible populations, particularly those children who are nine and under. I believe I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about highly susceptibles. If you have a menu for children, you can no longer have a consumer advisory on this menu. So the way that you get around serving me my sushi, my steak or my hamburger rare is do you have a consumer advisory in your menu? It identifies the item that is not fully cooked. And then it warns me that consuming this food may increase my risk of a foodborne illness. In a child's menu, if you do offer hamburgers, you are not allowed to have that um, have that consumer advisory or offer that hamburger that's not fully cooked because it's much too risky for a child under the age of nine. And if you do have any questions, please, you know, during the, the um, meeting today, feel free to reach out, raise your hand or put it in the chat and Allie can um, stop me and ask the question. Uh, let me go back. Um, so contaminated equipment, this is one of my favorite pictures. This says it all here. Um, contaminated equipment is a major risk factor and there's many different ways that equipment can be contaminated. Um, here's a classic, classic example of raw chicken on the same cutting board with some lettuce. Clearly this picture was staged because this is very blatant. Um, but I've seen lots of examples of contaminated equipment that have resulted in illness or outbreaks. Um, another one, I often see slicers that have not been cleaned and sanitized every four hours when in continuous use. And um, sometimes I hear people telling me they clean their slicer once a week, which is not nearly um, enough to uh, prevent foodborne illness. But dirty slicer blades, um, I've seen people drop their knives or tongs on the floor, pick them up and wipe them on a dirty apron. I Twice now in my career, I have seen people washing their cutting boards in the mop sinks. So these would all be examples of contaminated equipment. But speaking of contamination, let me also talk about cross-contamination. So other ways that we can contaminate equipment or food is in proper storage. So for example, in a refrigerator, you wanna make sure that you store your food to prevent cross-contamination. So in a refrigerator, if you had that raw poultry and you have this lettuce, you always wanna have the raw poultry on the very bottom. And then that um, lettuce that's ready to eat, it's washed, it's cut on the very top. Going through proper storage, if we look at all of the types of foods that we have, from bottom to top, we're going to be storing our raw poultry, our raw ground meat or fish, our raw meat, raw fish, and then on the very top shelf is going to be all of our ready-to-eat foods. And speaking of ready-to-eat foods, just quickly as a reminder, a ready-to-eat food is a food that requires no cooking, no further cooking, or no further washing before it's consumed. So I will move on. Another big risk factor is poor personal hygiene. And when it comes to poor personal hygiene, there's big picture issues and then some minor issues. For me, those big picture issues are those um, poor personal hygienic practices that can directly lead to a foodborne illness. And there's three big ones that I'm always getting my clients to focus on. 
when it comes to the prevention of foodborne illness, specifically viruses, and when it comes to personal hygiene, number one, do not come to work or allow any employees come to work when they're sick. And I'm not talking a cold. I'm talking about symptoms of a foodborne illness. So if somebody has vomiting, diarrhea, jaundice, a fever with a sore throat, you want to make sure that they are not coming into work because they could be transmitting um, foodborne pathogens to other employees and other guests. So poor personal hygiene. One, don't come to work sick. Two, wash your hands, get your staff to wash their hands regularly and thoroughly. This is one of the most important things that you can do when it comes to food safety in your establishment. And then the third big one is preventing bare hand contact with ready to eat foods. So these three, I like to use a three-legged stool analogy when it comes to preventing not only foodborne illness, but specifically viral foodborne illness. The three legs to this stool is coming to work healthy, washing hands, and making sure that you're using some type of barrier, whether it's gloves or tongs or deli tissue or something to eliminate that bare hand contact with ready to eat foods. Um, oh, the other ones that I was going to mention that um, are important, but not as big picture important as those three is that um, employees are always wearing a hair restraint. You'll notice in this picture that he has a, a cap on, which is great, but hair restraints also apply to people who might have um, a mustache or beard that would be long enough to contaminate the food. Um, other personal hygienic practices would include removing all jewelry and pretty much anything from elbows down. The exception is a simple type metal band. Um, clean outer clothing is another requirement when it comes to personal hygiene. So let's talk a little bit about monitoring temperatures. And I realize I have a whole bunch of pictures here, but um, two of the big risk factors that I talked about, inadequate um, cooking and then my hot and cold holding issues, we really need to keep track of our temperatures. So monitoring temperatures, there's multiple types of thermometers that you're seeing in this slide here. It is important that you have a thermometer, that you are using a thermometer every single day. If you are cooking foods, those TCS foods, that raw chicken, those hamburgers, the steak, the fish, you need to be verifying that you are getting the proper cooking temperatures. And the only way to know this for sure is by using a thermometer. Now, the thermometers that I'm showing you here, and um, I'm pointing with my cursor, I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but this one on the far left, this is a thermocouple. It's a very sophisticated, expensive thermometer. Um, I'm seeing this more often in manufacturing, um, but they do have some uh, thermometers like this that I see people use in the retail levels as well that you can actually program to the different types of foods that you have on a regular basis. The one that's right in the middle, this is called a bimetallic stem thermometer. It's probably the one that used to be the most common thermometer used in the industry. Um, but some of the other thermometers, the costs or the, um, they used to be very expensive. Now they're not as expensive as they used to be. So I don't see this one being used as much. If you do use this one, um, one of the limitations is it's going to take you a good 15 to 20 seconds in order to get an accurate read. So it takes longer to use this. And also, and this is something I want to point out, the stem on this is very, very thick. So part of the new food code says that if you have thin foods, so a thin hamburger patty or a chicken breast or a piece of fish, you have to use a thin diameter probe. So here I have um, two other examples. This is what we use um, for our company. It's called a thermal pen. I absolutely love it. I use it for all different food types, um, but you can kind of see right at the very tip, the probe, the very end is the temperature sensing area. It's very, very thin and I can easily penetrate a piece of delicate fish for sushi or hamburger steak um, with that probe and get an accurate reading. This one on the top, two things I wanted to point out. Um, one, it does have a thin, thin diameter probe, but you'll notice somebody is using an alcohol wipe on it. Every time you use a thermometer, before you use it and after you use it, you need to make sure that it's clean and you need to make sure that it's been sanitized. Um, we use alcohol wipes. Um, we buy... <laughs> thousands and thousands every time we put an order in of these alcohol wipes. And I will use multiple ones to clean it, 
um, and then uh, sanitize, especially if I'm using a thermometer on something like raw chicken, I want to make sure that I'm wiping it down really, really well. So do this before you use it and after you use it. You don't ever want to put a thermometer back in the case without cleaning and sanitizing it. The picture that I have here on the lower right, this is called a TTI, a time temperature indicator. And it's not a thermometer, but it is an indicator that will tell you whether or not you've met the minimal internal cooking temperatures of a specific item. So for example, um, this specific one came out about 25 years ago when we had um, we were having outbreaks of E. coli and you probably heard of the very large E. coli outbreak at the Jack in the Box restaurants. This is about 27, 28 years ago. The end of this is um, before it's used, it's white liquid crystal. And if you use a TTI that's intended for hamburgers, you put that white end in the hamburger, you wait a few seconds, you take it out. If it turns this dark gray, it won't tell you what the temperature, the cooking temperature was, but it's an indicator that you have met the minimal internal cooking temperatures. So you have to have a thermometer. Um, it needs to be accessible. You need to keep it cleaned. You need to keep it calibrated. Um, if you want to ask later how to calibrate it, we can talk about that. But in our hour long meeting today, we don't have time to talk about how to calibrate your thermometers. Um, but proper thawing, this is another um, thing that is important to talk about because I see in my practice a lot of people not thawing foods properly. So proper thawing, you have something that's been frozen. There's only four acceptable ways that we can thaw frozen food items. So probably the best and easiest and safest way to thaw something is in the refrigerator. The problem with this is it takes advanced planning. And we don't always have advanced planning when we are thawing something. So another acceptable method would be submerge the food in cold running water. Now I have a picture here. Um, so cold running water, it has to be continuously running and the water must be maintained at 70 degrees or lower. That temperature will prevent bacteria from growing. If you start to thaw something in nice, warm water that increases the risk for bacterial growth. So we wanna keep that temperature down. And it may not seem that cold, but if you think about it, our body temperature is about 98 degrees. So when you're touching that water, it's going to feel very, very cold. But again, the best way to confirm that you're getting the right temperatures is to use that thermometer. The third way to thaw foods properly is to microwave them and they immediately go into the cooking process. And one of the funny things when I teach the serve save classes is I talk about this and I use an example of shrimp, frozen shrimp or frozen scallops and every chef in the room is cringing, thinking that their product is gonna be put in the microwave. Keep in mind, my only concern is that you serve food safe. You're concerned not only with the safety of your product, but the quality. So if you don't want to be sticking the scallops or the um, shrimp in a microwave, um, buy them fresh or if they're frozen, um, thaw them in a refrigerator. But the fourth and final way, as you can see, is by thawing something by putting it directly into the cooking process. And we do this a lot. I do this at home. I can get frozen ravioli and they go from the freezer to the boiling water. Perfectly acceptable. You have French fries or onion rings. Uh, they're in the freezer. Maybe you slack them a little bit, let them warm up a little bit to about 20 to 25 degrees, and then you put them to a fryer. These are the only four acceptable ways that we can thaw frozen food items. Now, another thing that I want to point out here, and this is important, and this is also part of the new food code. Any frozen fish in ROP what is ROP? This is reduced oxygen packaging. So it's in the Teflon bag that goes through a machine that sucks out all the oxygen. I'm sure you've all seen um, smoked salmon that is packaged this way. If you are going to take it from the freezer and you need to thaw, it must be removed from the packaging before thawing if you thaw in a refrigerator or if you're going to thaw under cold running water, you would remove it from the packaging before thawing or immediately after. And the reason for this is because um, with, I, I'm, I briefly mentioned botulism. Botulism is a foodborne illness that is the most deadly of all of them. And it is associated with foods that are in 
packaging where there is no air. There's another type of botulism. There's different types of botulism. There's a type of botulism that is associated with seafood that, that is the most deadly of all the forms of botulism. So you have a package that encourages this botulism toxin growth in a food item, fish, that's more likely associated with the most deadly form of botulism that you have a double whammy here. So again, any frozen ROP fish, if it doesn't have any instructions on the packaging or it instructs you to keep it frozen until used, you have to remove it from the packaging before it goes in the refrigerator and completely from the packaging. You can't just like cut it open and remove it. You need to completely remove it from the packaging, throw the packaging away or thaw um, in cold running water, remove it from the packaging before or after. Any questions on this? I almost always get people asking me questions about this before I move on. And if you want to put it in the chat and I can come back to it, that's fine. And I'll leave Allie on the, the chat line. All right, let me move on. Here's another thing that I see people doing improperly quite frequently because this is a very time consuming process. Cooling foods. So you made a big batch of um, beef stew or you've made um, clam chowder or uh, fish stock or chicken stock and you're going to cool it and use it another day. You have to cool it properly. Improper cooling is a major, major um, risk factor for developing a foodborne illness. And not only does bacteria grow when you are um, in the process of improper improperly cooling, but there are certain toxins that will start to grow in these foods. So proper cooling, there's many, many ways that you can um, cool foods. This is just um, a sample of four different ways, but um, one of the most important things is to first reduce the quantity. If you are trying to cool this big, huge pot of, I think this is red sauce here, it's going to take forever. So reduce it to um, multiple shallow stainless steel containers. You want to use stainless steel. It is a much better conductor of heat than if you put these in plastic containers and then put it in an ice bath. So stainless steel containers, shallow containers. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you have, and I'm going to point to this. I'm not sure if you can see it or not. The rapid chill ice wand. It's this picture on the lower left. This is a picture of the ice wand in some red sauce that is cooling. Um, these are used... Um, you can either put ice cubes in this or you can fill it with water and then freeze it. And then when it comes time to cool the red sauce, the chowder, the stock, you would put that in the product and stir that inside. And if your stainless steel container is in an ice bath, it's being cooled from the outside in and the inside out. Um, another way to cool things, and not a lot of people have one of these because they're very, very ex expensive, is a blast chiller. And basically, if you haven't seen a blast chiller, it's kind of like a reverse microwave. It can cool foods rapidly, much more quickly than the time temperature requirements that you see down here. So these are ways to cool food. You can always add ice to a product. Um, but in terms of times and temperatures, let's say you're cooling a big... Um, pot of chicken stock. When you take that off the stove, it's going to be very hot. 200, 195, that is perfectly fine. Sitting on a prep table off the stove, 190, 180, it's going to slowly drop in temperature. Once we hit that 135, it is important to get this in the active cooling process because that is the outer limit of the danger zone. So what the code says is once you've cooled it to 135, you must reach 41 degrees in six hours. So I'm going to say that again. The food code says that you must cool that TCS food from 135 to 41 degrees in six hours or less. And here's the second part to this. Provided that it hit 70 degrees in two hours or less. So it's broken down into two steps. The first one that's most important is 135 to 40 in six hours or less, provided that it hit 70 degrees in two hours or less. You can always go faster than this. If you can cool it through that extreme danger zone, and this is another thing that I like to point out to people, when you're cooling something from 135 to 70, from 125 to 70, that's an extreme danger zone. So it is important to get through that as fast as possible. The faster, the better. And then whatever time you have to bring it down to 41 and six hours, that is the safest way to cool products. 
but um, in order to cool the products, uh, once it hits 70, you can put it in your cooler, but when it's in a cooler, it needs to um, be stored so that the hot air is allowed to escape. If you cover it, it's going to interfere with the cooling process. So uncover it, or if you are concerned about contamination issues, put it on a top shelf and maybe a sheet pan above it. Um, or you could put food wrap on it, putting holes in the food wrap so that some of the hot air can escape. But th this is the proper way that we can cool foods. And Allie, I am looking at my time. I'm keeping track. Um, another part of the food code, which is very, very um, confusing for a lot of people, is the new requirement for date marking. I thought this slide was very funny. This represents half of my family when it comes to storing milk in the refrigerator way too long. So date marking. Um, I will, ex you can take a look at the slide, but I'm going to explain it slightly differently, or I'm not going to read directly from the slide. Food code requires all TCS ready to eat foods that are going to be stored for more than 24 hours to be date marked. So I'm going to say that again, a TCS food that's time temperature control for safety, that's ready to eat, requires no cooking, no further cooking before it's going to be consumed. If it's prepared an establishment and going to be held for more than 24 hours, it must be date marked. It must be date marked with the date that it's going to be consumed or discarded. So my example that I always use for people is something like a chicken salad. Let's say it's from a can. You can buy um, chicken in a can just like you buy tuna. So let's say we're going to be making um, a whole bunch of um, chicken salad. The day that you prep, it's a TCS food, requires time temperature control for safety, yet it's ready to eat, right? It doesn't require any um, cooking, further cooking or washing before it's consumed. When you make that, if it's going to be held for more than 24 hours, it has to be dated. The date is seven days, but the day that you prepare it counts as day number one. So ignore the dates you see on here. Let's use today's date. Today is the 18th of October. So if we make a big batch of chicken salad, today's October 18th. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. October 24th is the date that that needs to be written on the packaging or on the container. And that is the date that it must be consumed or discarded. What's confusing here is that the day that you prepare counts as day number one. If you don't count that as day number one, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people doing is they are going now eight days, which is one day too long in a refrigerator. Any questions for anybody about this? This is always um, a confusing part of the food code. All right, so this is the first part of, of the date marking. Second part, let's say it's a ready to eat TCS food. And I have an example here of cottage cheese. Um, these will always have a manufacturer's date on it. And um, a lot of the dairy products that I have in my refrigerator right now that I haven't opened, the dates that I'm looking at are November and December. Once you open that container, that date is no longer valid. So a ready-to-eat TCS food that is prepared and packaged in a processing plant, so just like my cottage cheese here, um, we need to make sure that we do not use it beyond that seven days after it is opened. So the date must be seven days from the date in which the container was open. The day that we open that container counts as day number one, and you count again. So October 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 that cannot exceed the manufacturer's date. So what I'm always telling people is once they open it, unless the manufacturer's day is in the next seven days, cross it off, write the new expiration date on that. We also need to write the date that the package was open. So today we opened October 18th. We're gonna cross off that December manufacturer expiration date and we're gonna put the date that it has to be consumed or discarded. Any questions on this? Okay. So I'm going to take it one step further. So often, especially with something like chicken salad, it's not always going to be um, started in one day and finished in one day. So for example, let's say um, you're an establishment, a grocery store, and you've made um, or cooked a hundred rotisserie chickens. And then we have a big, huge snowstorm. So you want to turn all that rotisserie chicken into chicken salad that you can sell off in the next week. If that rotisserie chicken was made two days ago, we start with that date. So we wrote, we cooked the chicken 
um, I'm going to use October two days ago. So that would be October 16th. And you're making chicken salad today. We have to start counting from the October 16th date. So the 16th, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. October 22nd is the date that we're putting on the container as our expiration date. And honestly, since this regulation changed about four years ago, I haven't had um, anybody who's been 100% compliant with this regulation. And it's very important because um, bacteria that I mentioned, Listerium, is a bacteria that is very dangerous for highly susceptible people. It can grow in a refrigerator as low as 38 degrees. We can't see it growing. We cannot see bacteria. So the way that we know we are going to be serving a product that is not dangerous with this pathogen is we limit the amount of time that it can be stored in a refrigerator. We know that that time is seven days. I will move on. So let's talk about cleaning and sanitizing. So real quickly, um, high temp dish machines, uh, cleaning and sanitizing. Actually, let me talk about the difference between the two. So cleaning, we are getting rid of the visible debris on surfaces of anything. It could be floors, walls, ceilings, refrigerator, shelving units. Um, it could be food contact surface, um, cutting boards, plates, pans. So cleaning, um, we're getting rid of the visible or tangible debris. Sanitizing, we are killing 99.999% of the microorganisms. So there are different ways that we can clean and sanitize our food contact surfaces. The easiest way is to use a dish machine, which is what I have at my house. So um, I am guessing a lot of you have a high temp dish machine. High temp dish machines um, will sanitize by using hot water. Most of them, and not all, but most high temp dish machines have to reach at least 180 degrees coming out of the manifold to kill 99.999% of the microorganisms or bacteria. The interesting thing about the high temp dish machine um, is the water temperature will actually drop between the place where it comes out of the machine, out of the manifold, and by the time it hits the surface of the utensils or dishes or cups or whatever. You need to confirm that the surface temperature of those items being sanitized in a high temp dish machine is at least 160 degrees. So what I have here on, on the left here, and this is food code, all high temp, for all your high temp dish machines, you have to have an irreversible registered temperature indicator to confirm that you are measuring a, a surface temperature of at least 160. And you can see there's um, different types of devices that you can use. Um, I used to use exclusively these little, it's a TTI, kind of like the time temperature indicator that I showed you for the hamburgers. Um, it goes through the machine and it's all orange. And if it's reached at least 160 surface temperature, it will change. Actually, it starts out black and it changes to orange. Um, they're kind of expensive. Uh, and then I discovered this thing called a dish temp and I only had to buy one per inspector. And it's, it's great. It's easy to read. You can see on this um, disc, it shows that it was 162 degrees, which means that high temp dish machine was hot enough to kill all the microorganisms. Um, some places might have low temp dish machines. Um, I see this, um, if there is a dish machine in a bar, this is usually what I'm seeing in a bar. A low temp dish machine, you'll, you'll see here that the wash and sanitizer, the wash and final rinse is 120. It may not seem low because it's a lot hotter than our body temperature, but compared to a high temp machine that is low, but the way the low temp dish machines sanitize is by using a chemical. Most of them use chlorine. Um, I still have a few clients that use iodine, but most places are using chlorine. You have to use the right amount. It has to be dispensing at the proper chemical concentration. Um, you would know what the concentration is because it should be indicated on the bottle. But most bottles are going to say um, somewhere between 100 and 200 parts per million in order for that low temp dish machine to be properly sanitizing. Uh, three base sink. I'm going to make the assumption that everybody listening has at some point in their life uh, done some cleaning and sanitizing in a three base sink. Um, Everything has to have a pre-soaker scrape. We wash, we rinse, we sanitize, and we air dry. I'm assuming most of us know how to do this. New food code, which a lot of people don't realize, is 
you are also required to have a temperature measuring device, a thermometer, um, in order to confirm that the temperatures of the wash tank and the sanitized tank are adequate. So our wash tank, when we are washing with hot soapy water, it has to be at least 110. And then the sanitizers we're using, a lot of people use um, a quats, quaternary ammonium compounds, that solution has to be at least 75. So if it's too cold, it's not going to be as effective. And the way to know it's effective is if you're checking the temperature. Um, just a reminder, um, you do have to have your sanitizing solution set up. So either a spray bottle or a bucket, and you need to be testing them. Part of the food code is you have to have the test strips that are appropriate to the sanitizer you're using. I've sometimes seen people use one type of sanitizer, but the test strip is for a different type. Also, these test strips expire. So make sure that you are using test strips that haven't expired and are not water damaged because I will see that a lot. Um, pest control. Let me talk about some basics of pest control. Pests are like any other living organism. They need food. They need water. They need shelter. They like hiding places. So um, some common sense rules when it comes to pest control is to one, try to prevent them from getting into your kitchen in the first place. How do we do that? From the outside, keep the outside of your establishment clean. Get rid of trash, if possible, keeping your um, big waste barrels or your big um, containers away from the building, um, keeping trash away from the building, even keeping um, plants, flowers, um, bushes away from the building, because if it's close to the building, that's a really good place for pests to hide, and then they will find access to the building, um, but also denying access inspect any deliveries that are coming in because often pests can come in through items that are being delivered, whether they're cockroaches that can come in on um, in the corrugated boxes that we uh, have our liquor bottles delivered in. Um, produce, often we're seeing anything from um, fruit flies to ladybugs to worms. Um, so make sure that we're inspecting all the deliveries that come in. But um, common sense rule number two is as much as possible, you need to deny them food, water, and shelter. And how do we deny them food? Number one is keep the place clean. Whether it's mice or cockroaches or fruit flies, they need a tiny amount of food. And if your floors are dirty and your drains are dirty and you have overfilling trash bins, or if you have food or dirty dishes sitting out from the night before, that is a little picnic to all of these pests. So you have to clean up at the end of the night, get rid of the trash, get rid of the garbage. Um, another way to deny them food is that food must always be in tightly covered containers. If it's loosely wrapped or uncovered, you go away at night and they have access to this food. In terms of water, um, obviously all living creatures need water, so deny them access to water. So if you have any um, plumbing issues, you have some um, drains that are leaking or the water doesn't turn off or you have water pooling, um, sometimes I see that the um, grout between tiles is missing and water will start to pool there. It's a very small amount of water, but it's enough to sustain life for any type of pest that you might have. Um, hiding places is another thing. They need a place to live. They, they like hiding places. So getting rid of junk that you don't need. And I have seen um, places that keep every piece of old broken equipment. Um, they keep old menus, old napkins. And all that does is create um, nice little harborage conditions for pests to stay there. And if you're giving them hiding places, um, you know, old napkins for them to make nests, you're giving them food and water, you're never going to get rid of them. And then another important aspect is that you have and work with a pest control operator. They are the only um, people that are allowed to use pesticides if they're required, but they'll work with you and tell you and report to you. Hopefully you'll have a written report on um, what pest activity they are seeing. Um, hopefully good pest control company will have recommendations um, for the or how to eliminate or at least control the pests. All right, the very last thing, and I think 
um, Allie, I'm trying to speed up here because I only have five more minutes. Um, I want to jump in to Needham's food code enforcement, some of the um, new um, ordinance and regulation that was just passed, and then open it up to questions for people. So the first thing that I want to bring up um, is something that you need to know in order to understand the inspections and the um, inspection process in the new code enforcement. When we adopted the food code, um, Massachusetts has three types of violations and the way Needham does it is they broke it down into two. Um, a core violation, um, previously we would be referring to um, the non-critical items or non-priority items. These are really items that are not directly related to somebody developing a foodborne illness, but it's important that we are in compliance here. So core item, you could have a cracked floor tile. Maybe you have um, a light bulb that isn't shielded. Maybe the gasket is coming up off of a refrigerator. And then there are um, those violations that are much more serious that could directly lead to a foodborne illness or an outbreak. And this is broken down into two types of violations. One of them is called a priority item. And this is a violation that is an imminent health hazard to human health. For example, I come to work sick. That's one of them. I don't wash my hands. I serve somebody food. Chances are pretty good. They're going to develop the same foodborne illness that I had or we don't cook our chicken thoroughly. So we're now at risk of consuming bacteria like salmonella or campylobacter. A priority foundation violation is a violation or an item that is in support of my priority violations. This is, and to give you an example with my hand washing, if I don't wash my hands, this is a priority item. This could directly lead to a foodborne illness. A priority foundation item is an item in the food code that supports my ability to wash my hands. In order to wash my hands, I have to have access to a, a hand sink. I have to have soap. I have to have paper towels. It's not directly, if I don't have soap, it doesn't directly lead to a foodborne illness, but I need that, that soap in order for me to be able to wash my hands. And then if you take it one step further using the hand washing example, a core item, a non-priority or non-critical item, you have to have a sign at your sink that says employees must wash their hands. Nobody's going to get a foodborne illness for not having that sign. So that's a non-priority item, but that is pretty much how we can break down these uh, risk categories. So with the Needham's Food Code Enforcement, um, so this is the progressive discipline for food establishment violations. And Ali, um, at any point, if there's a question or um, I'm not saying this exactly as you intended, please feel free to speak up. But the way that most every health department works in, they will come in, the very first thing is we're going to do a routine inspection. Almost all of the time during this routine inspection, an inspector will find something. They might find some core items. We've got a dirty floor, a torn gasket, and a light bulb is, is not shielded. Um, they might find some um, priority or priority foundation items. A priority might be um, the food in the flip top refrigerators running at 46 degrees, um, and maybe they're not cooling something properly. So if they do find some items that are not corrected immediately, if you correct everything, then they're not going to come back. But there may be some items that may require a, a um, reinspection. They will come back. So on that reinspection, when they come back, if everything is corrected, end of story. They're done. There's no fines. There's no reinspection. If on that reinspection they do find that some of those items have not been corrected or they find new serious items, this is going to trigger a third inspection. Now that we have a third inspection, this is where the fees are gonna pop in. So we're gonna have a fee of $150. And I'm gonna talk about fines in a second. So this continues to happen. So if we find additional issues and they come back, it's gonna be another $150 fee, but this fourth ins inspection, for this fourth inspection, there will be administrating hearing with environmental health staff and a board of health member. 
And then we have, have another problem. If we don't get these violations corrected, or if there are new violations that are observed, we are now getting into the far right here where we have the fourth violation. We have yet another reinspection fee of $150. And then at this point, they are, um, there's probably going to be a health department or a board of health hearing, and it could possibly lead to a suspension of the permit. Um, one of the things I want to point out is the fees. You'll notice down here the disciplinary action. Um, when establishments do have uh, violations, and I'll, I'm going to talk about what some of the violations would trigger one of the fees, um, but it's going to be a $50 fine per violation. So if there's multiple issues and you're um, required to have repeat reinspections, the fines could definitely add up. Again, if um, when they initially come out, if everything's able to be corrected right on the spot, they are not going to come out again. But some of the violations can't be corrected immediately. For example, I was at a place in New York and they um, have been operating long before plan reviews were being done frequently and they didn't have a three base sink and their um, high temp dish machine went down. This was a client. I was not acting as a, um, a, a city or a town inspector, but this is a situation that could have possibly resulted in a revocation or a temporary suspension of their permit because they could not clean and sanitize at all. Um, they couldn't correct it immediately, but sometimes um, a violation that could be corrected immediately, if I'm using the example of cleaning and sanitizing, let's say their um, sanitizing um, solution wasn't at the proper concentration, gets fixed right away. There's no need to, if that was the only violation, to come back for any repeat visits. Uh, ticketing and fines. I realize, Ali, I'm two minutes over. I'll be very quick. Um, ticketing and fines. So tickets may be issued during any inspection. And the ones that um, would most likely be issued for any inspection would be those serious violations that I'm going to talk about in a second. They will be issued for specific repeat violations at the time of the third or fourth or fifth or any subsequent inspection. And then each repeat violation, there's a $50 fine in addition to those inspection fees. What triggers those fines? This is a very small list. And um, Ali, I took your list and I kind of modified it so I could get as much on one slide as possible. But um, I'm sure that you all have the packets that we sent out in, in advance, but most of these issues are either priority or priority foundation issues. Not having um, proper cooling, not having sanitizing solutions set up or no test strips. Um, maybe you don't have a thermometer that is accessible. Maybe you're not cooling foods properly. They, maybe you don't have foods date marked like I talked about with my chicken salad. So these are all situations and probably a small list, Ali, I'm sure you have a much larger list based on the food code, but these are all situations that could possibly trigger um, those fines, especially if they're repeats. All righty. I do apologize. I am four minutes over, no over my time allotted. This always happens to me. I apologize. <laughs> I talk a lot. Um, okay. I would love to be able to answer any questions about any of um, the topics <laughs> that we discussed today. And if you don't have any questions, that's fine as well, because I'm already eating into your time. We had one question um, mm -hmm. in the chat, um, and I will tell everyone um, I think I'm missing a few names. So if you haven't yet, please put your full name, email, and food establishment in the chat, and I'm going to record that for attendance. Um, but the question was, um, someone's looking for clarification on um, sell-by dates for ready-to-eat foods um, okay. and how long it's safe to consume them. Okay, so I'm going to say sell by and consumption, and I'm assuming that we're talking about date marking, if that's correct. So with date marking, um, the, the consumption and the use by date are going to be the same. So my example of making that chicken salad today, and this is making the assumption that um, I've either cooked it properly. So if I cooked the chicken today to 165 and I've cooled it properly, and then I'm making my chicken salad, I have seven days to sell it or serve it or consume it. You really don't want to consume it after that day, but today counts as day number one. So I make that beautiful chicken salad 
Today is the 18th, 18th, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So that, that is the maximum time. So it could be that chicken salad, the tuna salad. If you open up um, a package of um, ham, sliced ham, it's going to be, that would be the same example as I gave with the cottage cheese. We open up that container of ham. It doesn't have a month or six weeks like it originally had on there once you open it you have seven days from the opening. So if I open it today, I don't want to sell it or you don't want anybody to consume it after that seven day period today, counting as day number one because of the bacteria listeria that grows at refrigerated temperatures. I know I've kind of restated what I said earlier, but I'm hoping that helped. Um, and I will be sending out a survey for people um, to kind of um, give us your feedback um, on the, the food code enforcement policy and then also just the presentation in general um, by the end of the week. So keep an eye out for that. I have mostly all of your emails. Um, all right, so we have another clarifi clarification question about, so I think the question was more towards um, maybe a use by date. Like if you go to the store, go to the grocery store and you there's a use by date on there and maybe, uh, okay. Yeah, I think that was more the question. Okay, I'm gonna answer this two ways. So generally um, what people don't realize is dates are not required on products except for dairy and medications. All other dates on a product you see are voluntary dates. Some of them are expiration, used by, sell by, guaranteed fresh by. As a food service operator, you have to use all those dates as your sell by date. So if I have, I'm going to pretend this is um, orange juice or milk or whatever. If it says sell by um, October 20th, that is the last day that you can sell it, even though probably your orange juice is going to be safer beyond that, but that is going to be your date that you can sell something. And again, this is to protect the public. You don't know, let's say this is my um, milk here. You don't know if um, I'm healthy or not. I, maybe I have cancer. I've been on chemotherapy. The bacteria that can grow in here might be so little that it wouldn't hurt, hurt or harm somebody else. But being um, highly susceptible and having such a weak immune system, it may be enough to make me sick. So if that answers it. Um, on the other end, I'm a consumer. Um, my refrigerator, I, I leave, I know the exact temperature of my refrigerator. Everything is date marked. Everything is labeled. I do go seven days beyond some of my dairy products because I know the temperature of my refrigerator runs around 35. My product temperatures are about 38. I know that product is probably safe if that helps you. Um, It, and that that's kind of a hard question for me to answer because there's the regulatory side of me that says you can't do that. And then there's the other side of me that says I control my own risk factors and I know that the dairy product is probably safe. And another thing to say um, when it comes to dating, let's say you have something that has, um, I don't know, an October 25th date on a carton of milk. It doesn't mean a whole lot because let's say for a week, somebody left it in a refrigerator that was 50 degrees. Is it going to be safe up to that date? Or on the contrary, let's say that that product's been held at 32 degrees, it's probably going to last a lot longer than the data on the packaging. So long answer for easy question. Um, for you in the industry, for any date that is on a package of a TCS food, you cannot sell it or serve it beyond that date. If it's something that's not TCS, a package of chips or crackers, you can sell it beyond that date, but it has to be segregated from the other products that are not expired um, and your customers need to be notified about. It's not gonna make somebody sick, but something that has oils in it, like potato chips, the oil goes rancid. Is it gonna make somebody sick? Probably not, but you, you do need to segregate it. Did that help? Okay, does anyone have any other questions? And Katerina said, thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank <question>. you. <laughs> very good. Any other questions? I'm happy to stay on if you have questions. I know you're all very busy though. Yeah, if you don't have any questions, um, you know, feel free 
you have to be somewhere. Um, it is past 11. Um, thank you all for participating. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the question, any chance to get record of this meeting? Oh, you're on mute, Ali. <laughs> um, we will be doing, um, sending out a recording at the end of the sessions in November um, for people to review. It will be the same session or uh, there will be uh, more information? So this is, each session is the same. It's the same information. So the two in November will be the same. The only difference is there'll be one that will be um, led by a Spanish speaking instructor. Mm -hmm. in Thank November. You. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Allie? Yes. I couldn't put my email in the chat somehow, but I'm here. I got you. You're, <laughs> okay. you're good. Hi, Lisa. How are you?